wall of the global energy challenge. How a collaborative effort can prevent a worst case climate scenario. Nathan Lewis, California Institute of Technology, Pasadena. When the wall came down, I was in California, remembering the times that I had spent in Berlin visiting colleagues and was astonished that so much could change so quickly in such a positive fashion. I would like to tell you about a wall, a wall so tall that it is almost impossible to imagine seeing over it. The wall that has been built by humans that both makes civilization possible, but prevents it from being more advanced and more widespread. That wall is the energy infrastructure that we have built over the last century. There are two ways this wall will fall. The first way it will fall is because we will continue to build more and more bricks higher and higher, and then despite our efforts to have humans stand on the shoulders of other humans and on ladders on the shoulders of other humans as this wall teeters and will collapse under its own weight, we can push the wall and reveal what it has to show on the other side, the planet where there is wind, where there is sun, and where there is water that leads to a sustainable future for generations to come. And it is really our choice as to which way that wall will fall. Energy is the biggest problem facing society today. In my view, everything else can wait because energy is the problem that if we solve enables the solutions to many other problems like fighting wars over natural resources, like poverty, like famine, like disease. In fact, there is no other technology that you can say would come to the fore and allow you to solve as many other problems that face the world as solving the energy problem. Now, in order to understand how to solve the energy problem, we need to understand what the energy problem actually is. It is not that we do not have enough energy. It is that we have too much energy and don't have enough atmosphere in which to put all of the products. The world's energy meter now consumes about 15 terawatts, 15 trillion watts is the average rate of energy consumption on our planet. And all projections show that no matter how much we save, because of population growth and economic growth, that will double within 30 years to support economic growth and bring people out of poverty to something like 30 trillion watts. And that won't be the end. On the other hand, we have plenty of oil, gas, and coal to support even that enormous demand for centuries to come. The Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones. And the fossil energy age is not going to end anytime soon because we are going to run out of fossil energy. However, we have run out of air in which to put its products in our atmosphere. We know that humans are emitting carbon dioxide from fossil fuel consumption at unprecedented rates on our planet. We know that carbon dioxide levels historically for 670,000 years have been in a narrow band between 200 and 300 parts per million and fluctuations of only 100 parts per million have been correlated with but not proven to be the causes of temperature changes that have sent our planet into and out of ice ages. We know from the laws of chemistry and the volume of our atmosphere that our fossil fuel consumption will, within our lifetimes, bring that up to a level more than twice what any human would ever otherwise have experienced. We do not know what level is safe. 
There are at least six major climate models, and they differ from each other. That means we know that at least five of those models must be wrong. It is not what we know. It is what we do not know that is the very source of our reason to elect leaders because we pay leaders to act with partial information, not to put their heads in the sand and to wait for complete information in order to address the problems. <laughs> Here is what we do not know. We do not understand the rate of ice melting. And if you look at the graphs on the left and the bottom, you'll see the range of predictions of the rates at which ice melts, and then you'll see the solid curve of the rate at which it really melts, as observed after the predictions were made. And you can see that it melts much more quickly than even the worst case scenario predicted. We do not understand what makes a cloud rain versus just reflect sunlight, and how many of them will reflect light at different levels that can cool or warm our planet. In fact, it is our lack of understanding that means this is an experiment that we can choose to do or not with our planet exactly once. And we are the only civilization that will be in a position to make that choice. We also understand that there are nonlinear effects that we don't understand. We know the permafrost in the upper right is melting. And from bubbles in that frost, we know that as the sun melts that, it releases more gas that then accelerates the warming and releases even more gas. And we know there is enough CO2 and methane there that if it continues to melt, the levels won't rise by a factor of two, but could rise by a factor of 10. We know this happened 230 million years ago in the Permian era. We know temperatures rose on our Earth by an average of six degrees centigrade, 12 at the poles. And we know from the fossil record that 90% of the species on Earth could not adapt and went extinct. We absolutely do not know that would happen again. We absolutely do know that there is only one way to find out. In addition, no matter what you think about the effects of CO2 to the air, anybody that's ever opened a sparkling water or a soda understands that when you add carbon dioxide to water, you make it acidic. The pH of our oceans is lower already than it has been in the last four million years and probably in the last 20 million years. We also know that these effects are not things that can be reversed on a time scale comparable to modern human history. We know that the lifetime of carbon dioxide in the air that we will give to generations to come will change our planet's atmosphere for a time scale of about 5,000 years, even if we stop in 30 years completely. We know that from oceans acidification from volcanic eruptions, that the time scale for reacidification neutralization of the oceans will be 2 million years. This is an experiment that only we have the switch to decide whether or not we will do for our entire generations to come on our planet. Here is what data show, historically, the pHs of the oceans where coral can live and where they can live. This is what the ocean's simple chemistry, nothing more than freshman chemistry of pH, says where coral have historically survived in reefs at 280 parts per million of CO2 in the air. And the blue shows you that region. This is where it will be at 380 parts per million. This is where it will be at 450 parts per million. Within our lifetimes, this is where we are headed to 550 parts per million, is where we will find coral reefs for the next two million years 
on the planet on which we will give to our children. If you would feel good about doing this experiment, then I claim that you don't feel very good about what you're going to pass in your legacy on to future generations. So now let's think about breaking this wall by pushing it over instead of letting its weight collapse back on to the very people that built it in the first place. We know how much energy we use, 15, 20 trillion watts. We could store it all under the ground as CO2 that we bury and hope it doesn't come up to hurt us someday in the future over millennia if we found enough volume to put it, like putting dirty clothes in the closet when your mother tells you to clean up your room and then hoping that you open it up later on. We could do it with nuclear power. Each nuclear power plant is worth one gigawatt. And so if we chose to build a nuclear power plant every day for the next 40 years, we could by then have enough nuclear power plants in order to power our civilization. And on top of that, since they only last 40 years, you would have to continue to build one a day forever in order to just keep going what you already need. If you don't think that makes you feel warm and fuzzy, <laughs> then you have to look elsewhere into that wall that is revealed what nature gives us, how to get into homostasis back with our planet, to live in harmony with it. And unlike the laws of politics, there are laws of physics that cannot be repealed. The laws of physics say that the biggest energy source by far is the sun. More energy from the sun hits the earth in one hour than all the energy consumed on our planet in an entire year. One hour, one year. Nothing else comes even remotely close. All the wind, all the biofuels, all the ocean tides, all the hydroelectric combined are not even close to what the best nuclear power plant gives us the one 93 million miles safely away from Earth in the sky as our sun. On the other hand, as you well know in Germany, building photovoltaic cells, while beneficial in the short term, has a fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is that locally the sun has this nasty little habit. It goes out every single night. And solar energy just doesn't come in overnight. He that cannot store shall not have power after four. A hundred years ago, humans imagined what it would be like to have a world in which humans could fly like birds. We don't have to imagine what it would be like today to look around the natural world and say, nature figured this out. Plants do photosynthesis, and they take sunlight, water, and CO2, and they make a fuel. They do it very inefficiently and make a fuel humans cannot use. And so we have to trade food for fuel. But what if we didn't have to do that? What if we could build our own human-powered flight and make our own fuel from the sun ten times more efficiently than what nature could ever conceive of? Because we will redesign the machinery of photosynthesis in order to have the right colors of the spectrum, in order to have the right catalyst, in order to make fuel out of a piece of plastic that you could just unroll and solve the storage problem that cannot be solved by any other known technology. That's an inevitable technology. Humans are going to find a way to take the biggest resource they have and store it in the most dense form known to mankind, chemical bonds. The thing is that we want that human generation to be ours. We can already do this in our laboratory. 
We've shown it's possible in the last three years to make fuel <laughs> ten times more efficiently than the fastest growing plant. We haven't got it commercialized, but we're trying. I think there are only two ways to think about this problem. Either this is a problem that we can't afford to do, or it's a problem at which we, as a generation, cannot afford to fail. And I think that choice is ours and ours only. Thank you. Thank you.